Well, I think that's good. Welcome. I'm delighted to be here with you today. I'm Janet Brown, Chief Investment Officer of Fundex Investment Group. How many of you have heard about Fundex or know about Fundex? I know we've got at least some subscribers in the room. Couple? That's great. Well, I um, am pleased to make this very responsive. So stop me, ask questions, and we can that way address what's really interesting to you. I hope to spend a little bit of time telling you who Fundex is, what we do, why it matters, and new rules in investing that I think we all really need to be aware of. So I put this old slide in of me with Burberry to explain that I was really lucky enough to join a pioneer in the investment business way back. Um, he started the firm in 1969, joined in 78, at a time when no-load funds and ETFs were unheard of. And Boots intention was really to level the playing field, to help investors be empowered with information. In those days, there wasn't information available. And I had been previously working in a financial services organization where mutual funds were sold at 8.5%, and it didn't take very long to realize who was making all the money, the salespeople, not the investors. And I thought there really had to be a better way. So I was really fortunate to meet Bert, who again was a pioneer in recognizing that no load mutual funds are baskets of securities. You can buy them at no sales charge. And you can trade between them. Um, you can keep aligned with market leadership in a very efficient way. So I spent about 40 years developing this strategy of trying to identify what works the best in first categorizing funds by risk and then aligning with what's working. The Fundex Investment Group does a few different things. We have a do-it-yourselfer for those subscribers here know that we publish a newsletter and I've got some at the back of the room. This is a monthly publication that basically tells you which funds to buy and when to sell. The funds are categorized by risk and it's a very logical system of just staying invested with what's working in the current market environment. Um, Mark Hulbert used to, in fact, he still does monitor the uh, performance of all investment newsletters, and he said that this strategy was one of the best performing momentum strategies over the long term. So it's an evidence-based approach. We're really focusing on current performance and helping you adjust to changes in the market. There's a copy of the newsletter, monthly. The Upgrader is a quarterly publication because almost 20 years ago, in response to people that uh, didn't want to do it themselves, we started a series of mutual funds. So the Upgrader comes out quarterly, and that's more investment behavior, those kinds of things. So this is a chart that shows you our class three from the newsletter versus the market. You can see it starts in June of 1980 because that's when Mark Hulbert started monitoring our performance along with others. So the blue is the S&P 500 with dividends. $25,000 ended up being $1,475,000. Average annual return, a little over 11%. And if you had just blindly followed the newsletter like Mark Hulbert did to get these results and invested in our class three, which is the kind of core group of funds, it's not the aggressive ones, it's the funds with a market risk about what the market has. But by continuing to stay in those funds, you would, in a disciplined way, you would have gained and had an average annual return of 13.56%. So instead of a million four, you had over $3 million at the end of this very long term. 
It's on our website. The question one was, is this chart on any of the paperwork? It might be. I, at the back of the room, I have some upgraders, uh, but I know it's on our website. So that's fundex.com. I should. Yes, yes, that's a great question because we are in the process of doing that. The question was, is there any chance that we would put Fundex, our mutual fund out in the ETF form? And we have increasingly come to understand that the tax benefits of ETFs because of the creation redemption process are huge benefits to taxable investors. So last year was a terrible year for taxes because the market was pretty flat. The average mutual fund distributed big capital gains. Um, and these are taxable events to taxable investors. How many of you are managing retirement plans versus taxable accounts? Many of us have both. Um, so with ETFs, you don't have to distribute capital gains, and they're huge tax efficiencies. So I'm probably not supposed to talk about it yet, but we are in the process of negotiating with companies to, instead of having you know, open-ended mutual funds, having ETFs that follow the very same strategy. And it's just the um, mechanics of the creation redemption process that allows us to invest the same way and not distribute capital gains. Yeah, it'll certainly, uh, I shouldn't say certainly, but it'll be this year, but um, you can give me your card or your name at the end and I can call you and give you more details. You can always call the office and talk to Jeff or myself or you know, other people there, but taxes are very important. Net after tax returns are what we should all be looking at. You know, so much is focused on fees. Well, net net returns after fees, after expenses, and after taxes are what we look at and think it's important. So, yeah. So, I was spending decades investing money for people, and in my free time, raised a couple daughters and did a lot of nonprofit work. And along the way, um, I wanted to find a way to bring the two together, and now it's happening. And that's one thing I'll get to later. Um, performance does not have to suffer if you align with companies that are actually building a better world. Here I was in Honduras building a medical clinic. Um, and again, the significant thing that I want to get across is that where you put your money really matters, and institutional investors are aware of this. More than 50% of large global asset managers are looking at environmental, social, and governance screens. So millennials, women, smaller investors are all very concerned about it. Pension funds, like New York State pension fund, these big pools of money are looking at the material risks that come from things like climate change and conflict in the world and inequality. So that's being built into the financial returns of companies, and there's easy ways we can become aware of that and factor in that risk. I'll talk a little bit about that later. But right now, I wanted to just share with you our investor experience. So clients come to us because they're confused. They see all these geopolitical concerns. You've heard a lot about tariffs today. Um, it's likely to cut into profits. Um, the market's very volatile. We had one of the worst Mays in decades last month, and then the market's coming back now. The fourth quarter of last year saw us 
a steep sell-off and then it came back. So what do you do? Investors come to us really confused, overwhelmed because there are too many choices, dreading market declines. So these are some of the things I want to just touch on. Number one, um, don't focus so much on the headlines. They really don't help you get ahead. Over time, we've looked at market reactions to headline news. Markets don't react the way you think they might, even if you know what's going to happen, but we really don't know what's going to happen. Headlines do disproportionately focus on market declines, and the market's up two-thirds of the time and down two-thirds of the time. So I like to say that there's always uncertainty, but you really shouldn't let uncertainty hold you back from participating in markets. You know, I look at the last decade since the financial crisis, and the repercussions of the financial crisis have been really far-reaching. You know, in the U.S., we're doing okay. Overseas, there's very slow growth. And there's been slow growth here, but yet our economy looks pretty good. Um, you know, the unemployment rate is near a 40-year low. Interest rates may be... You know, they were going up slowly, now they're moderating, we have slow growth, so I think that we're okay, but the average investor is not. The S&P 500 is up 400% since the low uh, in 2009, and the average investor hasn't participated. There has been a trillion and a half dollars withdrawn from equity funds and a trillion two put into bond funds. So people are really freaked out by this uncertainty. And I'm here to hopefully convince you that with a system, with awareness of current trends and market performance, you can participate. You can invest along with what's doing well. When the market changes, you change. That's what upgrading is all about. So don't be so concerned with headlines. Um, anxiety about current turmoil. News leads investors to make emotional mistakes. The very worst thing we can do is react to a sell-off, sell off at a bottom, and then wait for the markets to recover and get back in. So I would suggest that the best returns come from long-term investing being aligned with what's working. Again, markets often react very differently than most of the news pundits expect. All you have to do is look at Brexit, the Trump election, many of the things that, even 9-11, um, you know, when you look at the, the long-term market reactions, it's not predictable and it's not consistent. Jeremy Siegel is a market historian and a Wharton professor that has said in stocks for the long run that less than one quarter of major market movements are associated with any big economic or political events. So even though it's tempting to think we can outguess markets, I don't think it's a wise allocation of our time. Again, market predictions are all over the map. These are really smart people that are forecasting market direction. At the same time, uh, here we have Goldman Sachs saying if stock market investors miss the surge, they're out of luck. Um, another very credible resource is saying about the opposite. Mixed but still positive fundamentals suggest value opportunity. They were forecasting a double-digit stock market gain. I do these talks periodically, so I always go back and look what people said. At any one time, you have very credible sources with opinions about whether the market is going to go up or down that really aren't that helpful. So predictions are all over the map. So. How do you deal with that? How do you invest today when you don't know what the future is? Basically, um, you invest based on what you can control and what you know. And what you know is what's doing well now. So 
This is an answer to overwhelmed by too many choices, too, which is the other thing I hear from investors that come to us. There are over 3,000 funds and ETFs widely available, 3,500. There might even be over 4,000 now. How do you choose and stick to them? Make a plan, and that's what we've been doing for decades. So we have a very systematic plan, a way of categorizing funds by risk and staying with them. It's a three-step process. One is screening these thousands of funds and ETFs by risk, categorizing them into class. One is the aggressive, two is in between, three is the high-quality growth funds, like core investments. Um, after we classify by risk, we rank funds by recent returns, and this is something we've tested over many decades as well, trying to optimize should we look at only the one year, the nine month, there are periods when nine month returns do better, but over many years, our formula of taking the one, three, six, and 12 month has a smoothing effect and actually has better returns over the long term than looking only at near term because we're including the near term but also long enough so we're not being whipsawed by buys and sells. So this chart is actually made up of a series of dots on this line, every dot representing a mutual fund. So this is a 25-year study of all of the funds that had long-term records for that period. And these are all diversified funds, so we're not including sector funds. These are funds with about the risk of the overall market that are diversified, actively managed and survived for this whole 25-year period. So the first question is, where did the market fall? You can see it's right in the middle. Here's Vanguard 500 index fund, smack dab in the middle. This left-hand axis is annual return. You can see the very best funds returned a little over 14% on average. And the worst funds in this study, a little under 6%. Couple outliers there that were really uh, lousy returns, but most of the funds had an average annual growth rate of between 6 and 13%. How do you select in advance the funds that are going to do well for 25 years? You can't. It's just pure luck. But upgrading our system that I'm recommending today of aligning with what's working and then adjusting the portfolio came in number six. If we plugged it in and compared it to the performance of all these funds over this period without having to forecast in advance, you still would have gotten really good returns by adjusting your portfolio. Yes, exactly, the six fund down. So there were five funds that had slightly better than 13.1% average annual returns for this 25 years. But how would you have known which five funds 25 years ago were going to do that? You know, even the best funds have lousy years. There's always press about... Good portfolio managers that have really good runs of 20-year returns, but even the best managers underperform the market at least a third of the time. So it's really difficult to guess in advance which manager is going to be in sync with the market for a very long time. It's impossible. I mean, it's pure luck if you really do it. And so I'm saying with upgrading, you don't need to know in advance the 25-year record, rather you adjust your portfolio as you go to get in sync with whoever is doing well at the time. Did that answer your question? Yes, sir. Okay. So, in addition to fund selection, 
I want to show you a very short two minute video that is something that I'm very concerned with and I think will more efficiently explain forced labor and widening economic inequality. And these issues are creating the start at the beginning. Some of the most serious issues facing the world today as identified by the World Economic Forum Global Risk Report 2017, include climate change, conflict, forced labor, and widening economic inequality. And these issues are creating material risks for investors. Climate change is having a devastating effect on our planet. Outdoor air pollution ranks in the top 10 killers on Earth. And by 2025, nearly 2 billion people will be living in areas of water scarcity. Meanwhile, conflict is forcing many of the world's poorest people to flee their homes. And with mass migration, there's a greater risk of forced labor. The lack of accountability within our financial system is taking vital resources from the people who need it most. It is estimated that over 100 billion US dollars is lost in unpaid revenues every year. It's no surprise that inequality is skyrocketing. According to Oxfam, just a handful of men own the same wealth as more than half of the world's population. Investors have a critical role to play in addressing the issues that the world is facing. That's why we have created a blueprint for 10 years of responsible investment. Our 1,700 signatories represent clients who control over half of the world's wealth between them. These funds can be used to support sustainable projects now, while also providing a dignified retirement for people in the future. Our aim is to create responsible investors, sustainable markets, and a prosperous world for all. But we can't do it alone. It's time to take action. Okay, so my point in showing you that was partially to tell you that um, over half of the large money managers, the global money managers in the world, are aligning with these sustainable investment goals because they see the material risk to our financial system of things like climate change conflict. This is the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And they really give us somewhat of a framework to measure the risks. There's something called an ESG score. E stands for environmental, S social, and G governance. It started in Europe by the big banks to get a, a handle on the risk. Um, now it's spread. The, the little video clip that I showed you was from the principles of responsible investing. When it started in 2006, there were 63 signatories of about $63 billion. And today, there's over 1,700 signatories globally. And the assets are tremendous. So the big smart money is looking at this stuff. And I think we as individual investors have to really be aware of these risks. And if we can align our money with companies that have less risk in this area, we're going to do better. So when I first started talking about this about 20 years ago, clients would always think that performance suffered. And now I can tell you and give you academic research that backs it up that performance will not suffer, quite the opposite. It's a risk management tool, and there's a positive correlation between what's called sustainable, responsible investing that seeks to make a positive impact and competitive financial returns. Here's a slide that, that um, shows there were over 2,000 academic studies um, in the last 10 years showing this positive correlation. 
So what is ESG? Environmental is how a company may be using water, natural resources, carbon footprints, how they're addressing climate change, waste disposal, how their recycling efforts or renewable energy efforts are affecting. Social would be things like safe working conditions for employees, health insurance, equality issues, um, the impact of their products on people's well-being. Governance is more things like CEO pay, um, transparency. One of the big concerns of people is where corporations are putting their money, what they're uh, donating to politically. Shareholder votes, and then equality. I mean, there's a whole group of people that have proven that more equality on corporate boards makes better returns. Um, there's even the New York State Pension Plan is not voting for board members unless 30% are women. So these are some of the things people are working on. Um, ESG management equals better returns, better credit risk, employee productivity, and innovation. It only makes sense to me that better labor practices and workplace safety that keep workers safe is going to mean a benefit to the company. Fewer defects, fewer boycotts, recalls. Renewable energy, for instance, is going to translate to lower operating costs. We've already talked a little bit about diversity on corporate boards. It promotes equality, but studies have found that it's actually more profitable. I borrowed this slide, or some of the data in it more accurately, from a professor that spoke at a conference that was in New York a couple weeks ago. And these are examples of ESG risk. So Volkswagen actually had a, a low ESG score that would have tipped us off to possibly the emissions scandal. There was a $15 billion judgment in the U.S. alone. Their share price dropped 37 percent. Johnson & Johnson's talcum powder resulted in over a $4 billion legal liability um, in the first two cases. There are 14,000 other cases. So their stock price is going to be affected by that. You can read these, the Vail iron ore trailings failures. I mean, not only were over 200 people killed, but there was almost $5 billion in fines and another $55 billion in potential liability. So you get the idea. These are material risks to financial profitability that the ESG score tips you off to. So I'm suggesting, even if you don't care about making the world a better place, you're going to be better off financially if you start becoming aware of what these ESG scores are pointing to. It's corporate behavior. It's responsibility to the environment. It's those kinds of things. One of the latest was the Boeing 737, uh, the potential li legal liability for deaths. Um, but not only that, cost of grounding those planes and stock price. Uh, I'm in California and was really affected by the fires, and now we're having regular power outages. Every time there's high fire conditions, they're shutting it off. And you know, as you know, PG&E's in bankruptcy. Their stock price is down 87%. So these are tangible examples of how it's really a new world. Not only do we have to be concerned with performance, getting good performance for us, but, but risks. Um, ESG is one way we can do that. So SRI tools, in the old days, it used to just be divestment. So people that wanted to affect 
they wanted to align their investments with their values would divest from companies. Um, South Africa was a good example. The anti-apartheid movement, many people think, resulted in changes to government policies because there was a, a coordinating concerted effort to divest from South Africa. It used to be that many people wanted to divest from tobacco, gun manufacturers, oil, things like that. But I'm going to show you that positive screening is even a better way, I think. Positive screening would be looking at these ESG policies of companies to avoid risk. And then engagement is something that's really growing. You may not have heard very much about it, but you will. Um, this is a company called As You Sow. And I agree with this. Corporations are responsible for most of the pressing social and environmental problems we face today. So they've really got to be part of the solution. As shareholder advocates, we directly engage. Um, how they engage is really interesting. And I'm going to give you some tangible stories here to show you. Target, for instance, um, was approached, Domini Investment, started by Amy Domini, one of the pioneers in this space, went to Target and said, you know, if you could reduce these toxic PVC chemicals in children's toys, it would be better for you, better for everybody. So the outcome was that not only Target now has a sustainable product standard that scores products, but other retailers like Walmart and Sears followed suit. As soon as this became well known, everybody said, well, well of course, we don't want toxins in our baby products. Um, so it's better for Target's reputation. It's obviously better for people. Another example of advocacy, Calvert Funds is a fun family I really like a lot, and they have prioritized engagement with electric utilities. So 53 major corporations have committed to source 100% of their renewable energy, uh, their power from renewable energy in the next two decades. Another great success story came with Trillion, um, great asset managers, who saw that Home Depot was one of the world's largest retailers of old growth lumber. After they engaged with them, Home Depot agreed to more sustainably source wood, and they've now really profited from that. They've sold more sustainable certified wood than any other company. And increase their profits, help the world. So it's really not being opposed to these companies. It's aligning with them and trying to help them and build a better world. So we take the approach in the funds we manage that, number one, we've got to be aware of these risks for sure. And we're going to prioritize funds that have high ESG scores and also managers that are really aware with their voting and their track records of engaging with companies. So it's really pretty amazing that we can combine our decades of fund selection with this added new risk management tool of looking at ESG. Morningstar and Sustainalytics now give you an ESG score for every mutual fund and ETFs. So you can actually see what their risk is for some of these areas. So you can actually pair a portfolio of good performing funds with, with high ESG scores that are going to minimize your risk. So, takeaways for long-term investment success. Flexibility, discipline, and humility. The only change is constant. Okay, so here we're looking at the last four quarter returns in the highest sectors, highest performing sectors. So in the second quarter of, of 2018, you see energy, consumer discretionary, info, 
in the S&P, best performer. Then it changed again, healthcare, industrials. In the fourth quarter of last year, the best performing sector was utilities. When the market tanked, real estate, consumer staples, the S&P was down, what, 13% for the quarter. And then things changed again. The first quarter of this year, IT, the Qs and technology, large cap growth. Real estate still doing well, industrials and the S&P is up. So what's doing well now? You know, May was another down quarter. We've been in a large cap growth market for nearly a decade. Things seem to be changing a little bit. We're seeing more value funds come up, some mid cap funds. My point in showing you this is that really is the only constant is change. You've got to look at current performance. I'm going to go forward a little bit to show you what's performing well now. And at the back of the room, you can pick up a copy of the newsletter if you don't already have one. But I mentioned that we classify funds by risk. In class one, iShares, Cohen and Steers, REIT is the top performer another real estate fund, and then Fidelity Select IT Services is right up there. Some of the utility funds, real estate, but these are sector funds. These are highly concentrated where we advise don't put a lot of your assets, small pieces of your portfolio in these funds. Class two, AcriFocus is a great stock picking firm. It's number one. You can just See for yourself. Aventon Gilead is a socially screened fund. Then in class three, these are your core diversified funds. And you can see Invesco, S&P, low volatility. SPL, uh, V, excuse me, is number one. No surprise in this volatile market. Uh, pollen growth. Brown Advisor Sustainable Growth is a fund that I've owned for years um, and really like it because they're good stock pickers that really pay attention to the risks of ESG and they continue to do very well. Class four, Total Return and Balanced Funds, is a good place for people that are concerned about market volatility. Typically, you have balanced funds here that do not lose as much on the downside. And so if it's really hard for you to ride through markets ups and downs, I would say go to class four. You've got Invesco Preferred, another real estate fund, but this Fidelity real estate fund is far less volatile than the class one funds. Vanguard's Wellesley is a long-term fund. So these balanced kind of funds will really help you stay invested over the long term. What's working now, I think I've covered that. I wanted to show you this because it's in the newsletter on page two, but it gives you an idea of how we're managing our large accounts for clients. And we've got a little under 10% in those high-risk class one funds. You can see them here. Class two, another 20%. But the big majority of this growth account, 70%, is in class three. And it's in funds like the iShares High Dividend, Fidelity Convertible. These are long-term growth funds that are less volatile than class one and two. And by staying invested in this class three, in fact, this portfolio has been in the newsletter since 98. During this period, the S&P has averaged a little over 6%. And this portfolio, 9.9%. Again, just by staying at the funds that are doing well now and continuing to adjust. So the upgrading tips I would say is don't bother forecasting. You really can't depend upon the headlines or know what the market's going to do. Accept the trends, whether you realize the reason for them or not, and realize the market's going to change. It certainly will change, and the best you can do is stay up with it by moving incrementally. Small little adjustments every month. And
And with that, uh, I had a lot more, but I'd rather open it up for questions. Balancing risk and volatility is a good way for you to look at um, S&P 500 growth, bonds. If you want a smoother ride, that's this class four. So that would be an account that's about 50-50. And for many people, uncertainty really throws them off. Stay balanced. And with that, let me respond to your individual questions about how you do it. They are exactly. You put together yourselves. That's exactly from right. The mutual fund universes that you use for these products. That's exactly right. So the question was about the funds in the upgrader por uh, publication. So we started out in '69 managing money for people and have done that for 50 years. About 20 years ago, people were coming to us and we published the newsletter for do-it-yourselfers and people said, "Well." Why don't you do it for us? Our minimum account size at the time was $2 million. So we started a series of mutual funds that do exactly the same thing we do for our big accounts. And you can buy those funds at Schwab or Fidelity or Vanguard or any place. And the difference in those funds between an average mutual fund is that they're actively managed. Every month we're doing this upgrading that we recommend in the newsletter. So at one point, Fundex, for instance, could be mostly international. It has been a couple times in the last day, well, in its 20-year history. One time it was up to 80, 90 percent international. The last decade we've been mostly all domestic because that's where the returns are. So it's going to change. That fund is not going to be stuck in one area. It's going to be actively managed. And the difference between those funds is risk. So Fundex is the fund that, let's see, I'm going the wrong way. Thought I was going back. Well, it's not going to let me go back, I guess. Here it is, okay. So Fundex, our flagship fund, is invested just like this monthly upgrade. Not just like, but it's about 70% in class three, and it's going to have returns about what this portfolio has. The more aggressive one, uh, hot FX is, is more in class one and two. Relax is the balanced fund that's going to be a lot like this. It's actually 60-40. So if you just, you know, for a small account like... Uh, grandkids or a long-term account, if you just want an actively managed 60-40, relax is going to keep you in the best areas in a balanced way. And then our latest fund, SRIFX, is only about two years old. And that goes for performance, just like Fundex, but it also considers the ESG scores. Mm-hmm. That's right, except, um, well, some people, and our friend here asked about ETFs, um, there are tax advantages to pooled investments, particularly in an ETF format, where as if you're a do-it-yourself or in a taxable account, every trade has a tax consequence. If you invest in a fund of funds, surprisingly, most of our distributions are long-term, so you're not bothered by all those short-term trades. So there are advantages. And I'm afraid I'm out of time, but how about if I answer your question at the back of the room? Yes. 